Hi, everybody. Just checking to see if you can hear me all right. Can somebody in the comments, can you, if you can hear me correctly, can you, uh, can you write that you can hear me? Can you hear me, Eric? Mm -hmm. Okay, we, we should be live right now. Okay, yeah, they can hear. Okay. <laughs> that was actually perfect. Okay, so my guest today is Eric Smith. He's a former friend of Chad Daybell. Eric Smith grew up as a Mormon, and he can tell you a little bit about that. He's a published author. He's written six books and um, three that are especially important to him. So do you want to introduce yourself, Eric? I will. Thanks, Donna. And um, I'm glad to be on your show. Um, the, the books that I've written, three were um, from a blog that I used to really, I was really heavily invested in called doctrinalessays.com. And this I is where, yeah. Way at the beginning, I remember coming across your blog and reading it. I remember that now. Okay, cool. Yeah. You've made some comments and likes and stuff over the years. Um, and so really those first three books are just kind of, it's just my blog compiled into book form mm -hmm. because some people like that format. And then, um, and then I wrote three books that are doctrinal based that really tie into the Chad Daybell thing. And, okay. um, and I want to talk, I'll talk more about this theme and, and some of this tier two belief system that he had. Um, okay. One of those is called mortal probation, multiple okay. probations. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Church of the Firstborn, and then the last one I wrote was, um, I am drawing a blank, Tides of Transmutation. Right, and, so spiritual law. Yeah. Spiritual law. And those are all available on Amazon, and you can find them on my blog. Okay, and after this is over, I'll put links in the description box, and so you can find his books easy if you want. Thank you. Okay. Appreciate that. So you were starting about you grew up in the Mormon church, you were telling me? Yeah, born and raised in the Mormon church. Um, and that was a big deal for my family. Um, where There's a thing in the Mormon church where there, that you pride yourself if you can tie yourself all the way back to its origins with Joseph Smith, the back east. And um, and I'm a Smith. I'm, I'm part of that family. And oh, yeah. so the, the traditions and the bloodline run strong. And um, along with that, expectations and a lot of culture. So. I didn't connect that because um, I've noticed over this last several years where I've had conversations with some Mormons where they start, you know, kind of rattling off who they're related to. Yeah. Within the scripture or the doctrine. Yeah. Um, yeah. That yeah, that's a big thing. Yeah. So my family would not be happy about they're not happy where I am and what I'm um, and and being on this side of things, but it is what it is. I'm on my own path, so it's okay. Right. That's yeah. why we. That's why we have individual bodies. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. To follow our path. So yeah. and then, so you guys, I was. Uh, I didn't realize we weren't live yet, and I was talking with Eric, and he. What were we talking about a minute ago? Oh, how well, you met Chad. Right. You want to jump back into that? Y yeah, because I think that people who don't know you um, just need that kind of background. Sure. Um, I would start that story by saying in about 2014, I, I, uh, I was active in my church. I went all the time, um, but I wasn't quite satisfied. And I started looking and researching and just looking outside of the box, so to speak. And, um, and my spiritual journey awoke, really. I read um, As a Man Thinketh by James Allen, and that just launched all kinds of inner path stuff for me, meditation and, and spirituality outside of religion. And, um, and in the process of this awakening for me, I was drawn to books that were near-death experiences um, where people had died and described what they saw, what they experienced on the other side of the veil. And just my wife and I just really ate those up. And we probably read 20 books or so. And um, Chad, somewhere along that journey, Chad came along and some of the some of the books he had published for some of his clients. And um, I read several of the books that he published. He had a speaking event in the Rexburg area I went to, and I just became interested. And shortly after that, he moved from Springville, Utah to to Idaho, just a couple of miles away from me. So I thought, this is cool. I like his books. I'm interested in these 
end time themes, these um, spiritual um, on the other side of the veil themes. Right, and, the revelations that come with, with the near-death experience. Right. right. And so I reached out to him by email. And uh, before I knew it, we had met several times at BYU Idaho's campus just to visit and get acquainted. And um, and it was it was nice. You know, we had some personal visits and our families got relatively close. We had some barbecues and things. And um, I, I helped and I helped host a few speaking events for Chad to promote his books. Uh -huh. They were just small, you know, at people's homes. Um, and he, other people in the area hosted a few of those as well. So I probably attended four or five of those. And um, it was nice. You know, I thought he was a nice guy. Yeah. So he seemed friendly and harmless. And when you first knew him. Yeah. Yeah. And he was, he was meeting a need for me because one of the doctrinal themes that I had started studying, like from scriptures was just the end times and what that meant, what that looked like. Uh -huh. So there was this big awakening of studying the book of Isaiah, right? The book of revelation in the Bible right. and trying to understand what this latter day end time stuff would look like. And he, you know, the scriptures are great and they have a nice backbone but what chad and others were doing at the time was just filling in some of the blanks through their own revelatory experiences right and that, that really met a lot of people's needs and interests especially because and this is this is kind of a core thing for me the mormon church which you know in in the title of its church latter-day saints that should be a predominant theme and yet they rarely ever spoke about it or taught it it was kind of a taboo. Times. Yeah, sorry. You're saying in the Mormon church, they rarely spoke about end times. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Or Even like though that? you would think it's such a prominent theme, um, and they might say it is, but rarely they rarely talk about it. And I started learning they never really talked about it in its true context. And um, it was always really filtered and and kind of cushy and just comfortable. You know, they didn't talk about the destructions and calamities. They just talked about you know, Christ coming back, which is, you know, right. a big part of it, but they skipped to me, they skipped over a whole bunch of stuff. And, um, right. and so Chad, Chad, and many of the people that he published books for filled in the gaps on a lot of those details. Right. And so it was really, it was really appealing to me and, and hundreds may probably even thousands of Mormons, you know, around. Right. He's in the yeah. That yeah. makes sense. And so then you were saying when we were offline, you were saying you you figure you you've been thinking a lot the last couple of years about how Chad got the way, and you were talking about some three tiered. Yeah, thing. is that what well, you wanted to talk about? Yeah, let's go there. I mean, the thing the thing that I've had to wrestle with, and many who were reading his books and and going to his speaking events were, is this idea that he was this kind of nerdy, quiet, interesting person who seemed spiritual. Um, and then what the news broke three years ago is like, whoa, who's that? That's a different Chad. He even looked different and dressed different. And it was just yeah. like this big surprise to all of us. And um, so I've had to unravel that. And and in my unraveling and just, you know, trying to figure out how this could have happened, I have what I call the three-tiered belief system of okay. Chad Daybell, you know. Okay. And that three-tiered system starts, the first tier is Mormonism. It's just basic Mormonism. Um, yeah, that's with, his base thinking. Yeah, with the exception, well, it's it's Mormonism. And um, the, the second tier, though, is what I've kind of already alluded to, that there was, for many Mormons, there's this unmet need. The, the doctrines, the church talks given from pulpits are watered down. And there's many of us who are like, there's more. I know there's more. Why, right. why aren't we hearing more about like end times or heaven or, you know, the afterlife and stuff? And um, I got a chill when you said that. So, yeah, yeah, a lot of Mormons probably wondering that. Yeah. And so, so Chad and others like him were, were fitting a need because the Mormon church wasn't really addressing those things. Um, and so the things they weren't addressing, like some of the Isaiah chapters or the Revelation chapters that talk about calamities and destruction, Chad was talking about. And so this is tier two. I, I call it tier two because the Mormon church does not spend a lot of time or focus there, although they have a tremendous core uh, doctrinal foundation for those things. 
both in the Bible, which the Mormons believe, and in, in the Mormon scriptures that are, you know, the Book of Mormon and some other books. Oh, so they talk about it. I mean, they have it in their books and in them, obviously, in the Bible is big on that. And then, but at church, they don't talk about it. Well, some would say they do and, and they do, but it's always really light and it's always really lighthearted and, and just stroke you on the back, make you feel good. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, you know what? I think it's a problem for everyone. Even like when I do these things and I've done say the world war three reading or whatever. And then people I've had uh, one person went to a mental hospital, um, had a total breakdown. Uh, some people wrote me that they were terrified. And then a lot of more people wrote me, they wanted me to do more. So I, I could see why as a church, I mean, even though it's, we can criticize the church, I could see why, you know, they're, they're in a, between a rock and a hard place with that topic. Yeah, that's a fair thing to say. You don't want to put your people in fear and put them in a panic mode, right? And right. because that's exactly the kind of mindset that leads to the sort of things that Chad and, right. and, and some of his followers got into. It's just a little extreme, right? And, right. Um, that's that's what we want to avoid. So I can appreciate that too. Yeah. Yeah, it's a conundrum. It's a conundrum because it's like I've even done another reading and I just didn't even upload it because if I'm going to terrify people, um, what good is that? You know, I think negative feeds on the on fear. So yeah, true. It, it, those, it is a problem. I didn't realize you had done readings on those. Are, are those available? Because I'm interested. Oh, yeah. On my... Um, uh, three days after the invasion started last year, I did a reading and I said, this is going to end up nuclear. And, um, but it's, it, it was such a interesting reading different than most of my other readings. And while I was doing it, and the, the imagery they were showing me, I didn't even know what they were talking about most of the time. And it, it took a whole bunch of listeners. So there's two videos after that with just trying to interpret the symbology that yeah. I was being shown. So yeah, so that's up, that's up there. And, um, you know, it's not good news. That's the other thing, you know, we're all, all wanting to be bright and cheery, right? Yeah. If, if you have anything you want to put out in the world, you're supposed to be positive and blah, blah, blah. Right. But, yeah. So I, I could, I could understand that. I can't criticize the church. Um, I think a lot of Christian, um, churches, have the same, especially the modern ones, you know, that, that try to appeal to a kind of broader audience. They stay away from almost all the controversial subjects in the Bible. Yeah, it's totally understandable. But, but the thing is, there are, I think all these churches are going to have to reconcile. There, there is a growing number of people who, who want it true. They want it raw. They want it unfiltered. And, um, right. and I was one of those. I would, I would say anywhere from, I don't know, 20 to 30 percent of any church is going to be like that. They want it real and raw. And um, and so Chad was kind of fitting a fitting a little niche group there. Yeah, you know? there was a void. There was a void there. People were seeking real answers, you know, um, and, and he filled that for them. Yeah. Yeah. And the caution I have and I've learned the hard way because of the some of the people I've associated with. I recognized gifts. I recognized truth. I recognize that spirit of this feels good. This feels right in a lot of what Chad said, not everything. Right. Um, and others that, you know, supported him or that he supported. But um, there's, there's a tendency for people when they recognize any bit of truth, they tend uh -huh. to throw in all their energy. And I was like this. I threw in all my energy with that person because I recognize truth, but what tends to happen is they, you know, there's bits and pieces that come in through, through their own filter that Correct. is not true. Right. And they can Correct. mislead you and, and guide, misguide you because of that. And so, so I'm in a place now where I just, I like to listen to everybody, hear what they had to say. I'm way more sovereign and independent now in my thinking and just, mm -hmm. I select what's true and works for me and just throw the rest out and move on, you know? Um, so it's like so, more discernment as far as, so I think even the U S military has binders where they've figured out, like if you put 90% truth and 10% lies, then almost a hundred percent believe it. And if you put 80% truth and 20% lies, then 60 per, you know, they have it down to a science as far as what's, you know, how much falsehood you can mix in with truth. 
Yeah. But then there, there's people like say, you know, me being a psychic medium there, you know, I am going to see things through my filter. And not only that, I'm going to see things and try to interpret what I'm seeing and I might be interpreting it wrong. So right. every individual needs to have that discernment of what feels right to them, not just she said this or he said this. Exactly. Uh, you know, I I actually listened to one of those channelings that you did, and and I was recognizing that very same spirit of truth. Like, I can tell as I was listening to you, you were tapped into a divine source. You were getting real information, and I knew it. You know, and so yeah, I that's yeah. what I look for. I'm what, were you one of the people I pestered during? See, uh, all of Chad's friends that I could locate, um, I was sending every reading and writing these long letters, you know, the AVAL people and mm -hmm. stuff like that. Just, um, I actually made a lot of Mormon friends. I had one Facebook profile that was taken down, but I had written on Christopher Parrott's page a bunch of times. You know, oh. I, we had, uh, Teresa, my friend there, the moderator, so she signed up for AVAL. So we went in there and I realized that's another thing feeling a need. All these people were wanting to talk about it, but Christopher Parrott was ordering them to not talk about it. So I would go on his page and say, come look at my page. I'll tell you what happened, you know, and have uh, all these. Yeah. I was like uh, a bunch of them, even Chad's neighbors contacted me after, once the remains were found, but before the remains were found, nobody would believe me. I kept trying to tell all Chad's friends and nobody, not one, Chad, not one person Chad knew. So you're not the only one who got duped. Well, not one person yeah. Chad knew would believe me until after those remains were found. Yeah. Yeah. That's not too surprising. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah, so he had a good front. Um, and maybe he truly believed it. And maybe he turned at some point. I don't know. I don't um, know. Yeah. At what point he turned, I'm not totally sure. I have some thoughts. But um, but, but just to give the backing to your listeners, the backing for that sort of system of really believing and giving all your energy and all your support to a charismatic leader, that comes right from the Mormon church. And oh, so they're trained to do that. Yeah, there's this, there's from the time you're, you're born and you're in this program called Primary for Children, Youth, they have this song called Follow the Prophet, Follow the Prophet. And um, if you go look at the words of that song, it's 90% it's the lyrics are Follow the Prophet. And then there's a couple um, other words and they repeat it, Follow the Prophet, Follow the Prophet, Follow the Prophet. They're actually, they're actually programming the little child to take everything that person says as fact. Right. So, so anybody who was in the Chad camp and enjoyed what he said had that programming, that background of here's someone spiritual, they're tapped in to a divine source. Just give them all your effort, all your energy, all your support. They're not going to make a mistake, you know? So that's important for people to understand. And, yeah. So he had ready made followers, really. Yeah, it's yeah, it's true through his books and stuff. And the church would the church would have said, "Don't ever follow somebody like that. Just mm -hmm. follow our prophet, nobody else." Right. You know? And so, I yeah. notice they call they keep calling the head guy the prophet. Yeah, right. And and who's whoever tested him that he actually does have divine revelation? The head guy. That's what I wonder too. Yeah. Well, I Not mean, or anything, but is he even a psychic? I personally, I don't feel like his spiritual gifts are very strong. At least I don't see evidence of it in his speeches or anything. In fact, I've heard people write his speeches for him. Yeah. So, so that's, I kind of wondered about that too. Um, but I don't want to, so, so, okay. I, I don't know if I veered you off. So you were talking about the second tier where Chad was yeah. feeling this, this hole for people, this, this need for information. The second tier is fringe to the Mormon church. But here's, here's what I find in it. They, every bit of fringe in that tier two is based in some teaching, some uh -huh. um, scripture, right? So, so my three books um, are based on that tier two. They're fringy. They're the things that they aren't talking about, and yet leaders in the past have talked about them a great deal, okay. um, including Joseph Smith, Brigham Young, some of those early founders. And um, they just don't talk about it nowadays, which in itself is kind of a red flag. It's like, why aren't we talking about it? This was right. doctrine at one point. Reincarnation yeah. is an example of one of those. The idea that we 
can come to the earth many times in a, in a cycle or something. And I believe that I, I, I don't have it to me. It's not fringe in the size bit. Like I've yeah. done multiple past life. Uh, re, um, I forgot it, but when you go into your past lives, I've done that a bunch of times. And uh, I know that reincarnation was actually in the Bible and they took it out. Yes. So, you, you know what I mean? Yeah. The, yeah, I'm, I'm all for that reincarnation. So whatever Good. you want to about that. Well, the reality is most people are, if you look at, if you go survey the world and most world religions are, but Christianity isn't. And, um, you know, in a nutshell, it's because Constantine and other tri translators of the Bible filtered some of those things and controlled the narrative. And uh, that's what my, my one book is, is written on multiple probations. And, and to be honest, you go sorry. through the doctrine and, and, and point out where this is actually a legitimate part of the religion or should be, or. Is yeah. That what yeah. My, I had a co-author and he and I wrote this book and we had a hundred sources that were scriptural or from um, right from the Bible, from Mormon scripture or from Mormon leaders okay. that, that supported this. And so I think right. it's, I think it's a, it's a good, a great book, of course, but um but that was that was an example of one of the fringe doctrines that I was studying, and uh -huh. um, and it's and really not fringe because it's like like some lady named Mary Baker Eddy, uh, she's deceased now, but she wrote a really thick book I used to have, and it, it was like what you're talking about. It's all it was all through the Bible, and they took it out, yeah. you know, part of their subjugation and control, whatever their goals were. Reincarnation has always been a part of, I think, religious doctrine. Yeah. You know, the Hindus, it's a given. It's not even, they wouldn't even argue against it ever. They're, they'd be like, of course, you know, and and in, in the Christian Bible, it used to be there. And I think it's logical. If, if the earth has been here for like 5 billion years, um, it's a little silly to think that you only get one chance at coming and experiencing the physical realm. Right. right? I, I totally agree. Yeah. That's a basic one to me nowadays. And I think more and more people are waking up to that. And I think religion, especially Christian religions, are going to have to face it and realize we're missing something. Because it, that belief system really started filling in a lot of answers to questions for me. That, And, and it continues to answer those, those unmet doctrinal um, curiosities and just things in my heart that just were unresolved. That helped. But so as I started to learn and study that, research that, um, I had a common friend with Chad who who I was like, hey, have you heard of this? Do you, you know, what do you think? And he's like, no, 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 that's not true. Um, a year later, he, he starts waking up and he's lit up by it. He feels the truth in it and he starts talking to Chad. I didn't talk to Chad directly about it, but um, he starts talking to Chad. Chad's like, no, that's not true. I don't believe it. And and by and by, Chad became, I mean, he became lit up with it. And and his gift, Chad was always gifted. You could tell. I could I could watch him in kind of a, I don't know what you would call it, Donna, but just a, a mode of inspiration, you know, a message coming through. I watched Chad have these experiences, you know. Well, what I'd say about Chad is I only had to read one paragraph of one of his books and I knew he was a real psychic. So mm -hmm. while the, you know, this is before they found the remains of the kids or anything. Um, so while, you know, social media, there's so much ignorance, just, you know, they would think they were so smart making these jokes. And I'm, I would be like, Chad is a real psychic, you guys, you know, I understand the, the things he is saying, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I have no doubt he's a real psychic. Right on. Well, that's, that's true. I mean, yeah. So again, it's just comes down to that filter and what we do with that, and, right? Uh, how we interpret what he says. But um, by and by, he be he became to believe it, teach it, be an advocate for it. He used his gifts um, to discern things about people and their past lives. He did it for himself. He did it for me. For a bunch of friends, um, he he kind of became this self-appointed, like past life dictator like he, not in the sense of like, like he's the dictator. ultimate authority on, yeah, yeah i'm gonna point you you were this and you were that and yeah right I, and people would seek him out and say hey can you come over and like you know help me understand who i was or why i'm having these experiences 
Right. Right. So, so that, um, that makes sense. And that in that sense, I'm a little frustrated. I was getting my own insights, my own understanding about myself, my past journey, um, how it worked. I'm a little frustrated with myself that I gave him so much authority in that area because he did tell me things and I really believed and trusted. And I, I now see that I don't think a lot of that was correct. Maybe all of it. Um, but do you and, know what I have to say about that? Yeah. Um, in the past, there was a time and I did have a demonic attack, right? Like, you know, I'm, I'm doing what I do and I did have that. And I asked my spirit guides, um, why, they allowed that and this was when i was doing the evp electronic voice phenomena and they said because they wanted me to warn people they wanted me to know it was real and they wanted me to warn people so with you and chad uh, with you being duped by chad but you are a prolific author you're a writer you have the ability to warn people you have the ability to say you know certain things are true but you also need your own discernment and unless you experience that you wouldn't be able to do it. So That's, it's an important thing. I think in the same way that. that my spirit guides told me that. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate mm -hmm. that. I can see you're speaking from personal experience. And uh, I I think I will own that. I think that's really good insight. Oh, yeah. yeah. You, you have some, you have an experience that that you would you wouldn't be able to have unless you had been duped because you wouldn't be in this level of reflection of yeah. what's real and what's not real and being able, able to sort it out and then help guide others. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. Thank you. I think that's wise. There were, uh, there were other things in this tier two fringe belief system. And this is, this is another key. Um, I would probably put it in maybe five or six different doctrinal categories. Uh -huh. each, each of them had their own way of contributing to the Chad that we heard about in the media. And, one is the idea of the church of the firstborn, which is a scriptural concept. It's mentioned in the book of Genesis. It might be in the book of Revelation. I'm a little rusty with my scriptures these days. but um, So it is a biblical concept. Okay. The church of the firstborn is talked about more in the Mormon scriptures. So Mormons are going to have a little bit more to say about the church of the firstborn than Christians at large. Um, again, it's a taboo topic in the church. If you were... It, I, while I consider this a core Mormon doctrine, if you were to mention it in a church meeting at a Mormon church, people would look at you and say, that's a little weird. You shouldn't be talking about that. Basically, Even though you can- Church of the firstborn? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's not something they teach, although it has been taught. Again, see what I'm saying? And this was, yeah. this was as a researcher, this was where I was like, what's the deal here? I see doctrine. I see it in black and white print right here. Why can't we talk about it, right? And it was that attitude, it was that interest, that curiosity that got me excommunicated, especially when I wrote my book, um, multi Mortal Probation. Sorry, Multiple <laughs> Probation. They excommunicated you? <laughs> they excommunicated me. They, not for the book, they said I could have my beliefs and that's fine, but they didn't want me talking about my beliefs. And I had a oh. podcast, I had a blog, and that's, yeah, that's, they wanted how, that's to how they out. control. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's a, it's a lot of control, I noticed. Yeah. So what is the Church of the Firstborn? Well, I will invite you to go read my book. <laughs> okay, you have it right there. You can show it. Yeah. I noticed you had written that, and I noticed you published it after Chad was arrested, though, right? Yeah. Uh, let's see. No, that was. I am awful with dates. I'm going to slaughter. I'm. I better not answer that because I'm not sure. To be honest, I think I published that one before Chad, um, and the whole news broke. Oh, okay. Maybe I, I just noticed after that because Chad, didn't Chad want to call his Church of the Firstborn too? I don't know. I don't know because that's the that's the tier three Chad that I didn't know, oh, and I'll okay. get to that. You know, okay. but um, but but in a nutshell, the Church of the Firstborn is not a church at all. It's uh, it's a belief system, and it's those who are pure in heart, and okay. and it really is about that simple. There's some other details and stuff, um. It's those who are close with Jesus, but not just Jesus. In my opinion, it's not just Jesus. It's just people who have a compassionate heart, who want to serve, who want to live in a better world and um, and stop being controlled by all these control systems, you know. So it's not um, a physical place. It's, it's in your heart. You love God and you want to serve God and you want to do right and be in alignment with God. Yeah. Right. 
Yeah, that's that's how I see it more and more. And and I have changed my views slightly since writing the book. It, the book is going to have a more religious theme to right. it. Um, where I am now, it's more of a spiritual theme. I, I don't see any particular religion like controlling all that. You know what I mean? So, yeah. um, but the one of the core parts of this uh, of this church of the firstborn, and this is this part is very scriptural, biblical, I would say, is the idea of a servant in the last days, a leader who is strong, who is kind of like the Samson of the Old Testament, you know. Or like the Jews were looking for in Jesus when he came along, they were looking for a fearless warrior, somebody who was going to annihilate the Romans, you know, um, and corruption and government control. And um, and that's a part of the Church of the Firstborn teaching. Now, Mormon Church doesn't teach anything about this, again, because it's a fringe doctrine, right? Mm -hmm. So the so that hungry, eager to learn part of the church who who knows there's something there, they're a little frustrated by the church not teaching about it. So what do they do? They're gonna they're gonna go read and study and listen to people's views on this, right? And form their own opinions. And one of the one of the things that's pretty clear, and I would point people to Ezekiel chapter 34 is kind of a key section because it describes the shepherds in the last days who who are um, feasting on the flock, praying on the flock. And, you know, so, so the interpretation is church leaders in the end times are not going to be doing their jobs. They're going to be profiting in the, you know, which, which is going on now in a major way. Yeah, I would say so. All over, and, I, and I mean, across many religions. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I agree. And, and then it describes a, a point where um, Ezekiel says, he's, he's speaking for, you know, Jehovah and says, I am done with these shepherds. I'm going to do away with these shepherds and I'm going to come. I'm going to return and I'm going to take care of my flocks. I'm going to feed my sheep and all that stuff. And it's a, it's a really awesome chapter. I, people, everybody should, this should become one of the highlight of the whole Bible is this very Jesus chapter. Jesus Christ says that. So this is Ezekiel chapter what? 34. 34. Ezekiel 34. chapter 34. Yes. Yeah. And that. there's actually, gosh, there's probably 20 different chapters in the Bible that have the very same theme. And then, and they even use this phrase in it. Isaiah is a big one. Um, then I will send my servant David to feed the flocks and stuff. And so there's this, there's this figure that's mysterious that's discussed there. Who's going to come and restore and return justice, you know, and take care of the flock. And and they even called him David, you know? And so that's kind of yeah. exciting to people who are researching. They're like, "What? Is, who's this David? And um, and then Mormon scripture adds on to that a little bit, just gives a few more yeah, little details. Hurt. And so that's exciting. Um, but, sorry. Oh, no, I say you froze for a second, and, and but you came back right away. So go oh, okay. about David. Yeah. And so... Chad, so now I'm going to go back to Chad. At this time, Chad's having lots of speaking events. He's writing books. He's been pretty successful. He has a big following. Um, he's well-liked. I started to see um, just, just a sense of him knowing who he was and being proud about it. Not in a necessarily a bad way, but maybe. Right. I don't know. Um, and um, he never said this to me. But, but the belief is, I mean, we did at times talk about the Church of the Firstborn and this Davidic servant figure, but um, he never said it. But it's pretty clear. It's pretty obvious that he thought he was that person. Now, you mix in the past life, the reincarnation, and all this idea into it. I really believe he really started to think he was somebody pretty special, even biblically, even prophesied to be the one to come and bring... Um, bring order to the kingdom of God, you know? Yeah, so he might have got a little delusional himself. Yeah. Not just Lori, but him, Chad, too. Do, yeah. I mean, full, full of, like, I'm the one now. I'm not just a servant. Like, I feel like I'm serving God. I do yeah. um, in what I do. And amazingly, even though this stuff's so brutal and gruesome, I have reached more people and um, than I ever would have just at church uh, with this proof of what occurred here, I have so many letters from atheists who say they 
had to turn their whole life around and are now on a more spiritual journey. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to tell them though, that I know everything and I'm the, I am the coming of Christ or I am the messenger. That's where he gets into the cult kind of behavior. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I think there's lots of messengers out there. And Jonathan Kahn is just another guy that comes to mind. Who's, who's a messianic Christian who has a big following and, I think he speaks for the Lord sometimes, you know, and um, I think there are many. I, I certainly believe you are too. Yeah. But so Chad started feeling this Davidic principle. I think we, this is what we talked about a couple of years ago or a year or so ago on the phone. Yeah. Um, it, it means that you're beholden to, you're working for God and man's laws don't apply to you, right? You were explaining yeah. it more like that. Is there more than that? Yeah, I think I think that's fair. I think you start to believe that um, in this new kingdom that's coming, um, you know, the millennium, or um, some Christians would call it the um, uh, what do you call it? The uh, where you're taken up in the clouds. Oh, the second coming. Oh, the rapture. The rapture. Yeah, the rapture. Second coming. This kind of idea. This is an idea that humanity is now ascending and there's new laws, there's new, uh, there's new laws. And yeah. I think if, if you, if you look at it that way, Christ is coming back, there's new laws we've done away. You know, there's at this point in the narrative, the scriptural narrative, you would believe that there's been great calamities and destructions. The wicked people are basically destroyed and the organizations are destroyed. You're left with righteous people, faithful people who want to build this new world. And, um, and uh, and with that new world comes new laws. And this was also never explicitly stated, but it's just kind of assumed in some of these tier two belief systems, these circles, social circles, that there's new laws. And um, if there's crime among you or wicked people among you, you're authorized to destroy them in the name of God, kind of like the old Bible times where right. you know, wow. God wow. said, go and destroy, you know, this city. You know, there's some of that in the Bible and it's a little troubling for us to understand, right? Go destroy yeah. every man, woman, and child in this city. And that came from God's wow. voice. So, so what you have there is a scriptural justification for, for murder, essentially. Murdering everyone that's not like you. And the Islamic religion, they that's definitely there. And so in the Mormon religion, is that there as well? That in the, in, in times, it's okay to murder everyone who's not of purity of God? No, that's definitely not in tier one Mormonism. I wouldn't even say that's in tier two fringe Mormonism or, you know, fringe beliefs. That's not actually something we ever talked about. I never talked about that with Chad, this idea of justified murder or adultery or whatever, these kinds of things. Okay. So that'll that, be three. That's where we're getting into tier three. And, right. and um, I never got into tier three beliefs or discussions with Chad. I just, I didn't know they existed. Um, yeah. The idea of zombies and what that looked like. I had never heard of that. It was absurd to me. When the media came out and talked about zombies and stuff, I'm like, Psh, they're just trying to smear Chad. Chad never talked about that. You know, that was my yeah. reaction. Okay. And so Chad, you could, you never heard him talk. And so Jason Mo, I don't know if he, you know who he is, but that cop that was the former cop who was friends with Lori Vallow, he made a really low budget or was part of making a real low budget movie. And uh, I don't know if you have seen it. No. Well, it will the whole it's the whole thing is about this small town where the children have become possessed by the devil. So they're turned into zombies and they actually call them zombies. And then it shows how hard it is for the parents to have to kill their children to get rid of the zombies. Oh. And and literally it's it's a playbook for what they did. And the whole movie is really low budget poor storytelling but when the one the the parents and killed the girl the main character um and they were doing that to, they had to sacrifice their love for their daughter to get rid of the evil spirits because she was possessed um i actually clipped that part out and changed it up and used it in one of my videos because it was the closest thing i had ever seen to what occurred with tylee interesting 
Mm -hmm. And it's in your part own of that movie. psychic channeling. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, when uh, Teresa, she made a video comparing some of what the things I said with, and I, I've put that on top of her video. And, um, but yeah, yeah. So, th and they use the word zombie in that movie too, for, for the children who had been possessed by the devil. Yeah. Well, this, you're describing a tier three, a system that I never heard of. I don't know anything about it. My only exposure to it was through the media, like everybody else. Um, right. But it's become really compelling. I mean, the evidence that's coming forward that he believed those things, it's sickening to me. I don't understand it. It, it doesn't fit into what I believe um, in that tier two belief system. Right. So let's go back. You want to go back to tier two because we only touched on Church of the Firstborn and there's a lot more, right? Yeah, there's a few other things. Church of, I don't even, I, it's all, I have left all this, this whole world for a while, but um, Church of the Firstborn is a big part of it. The And the idea is that that would be found or, I don't know, led or supported by this servant figure that was, that was mentioned yeah. in Ezekiel 34. So Jared started believing that he was this figure working directly for God. It seems that way. And again, I never heard him say that, but his actions really started to su suggest that he, that was his mission, his job. And he started using that word like mission, his mission here, you know? Um, yeah. Well, do you know the spirit guides use the word mission too? Oh. Uh, when they first, when they first brought my daughter in and then they brought Tylee in, Okay, the, my daughter, Tylee, could not have come in with that strength without the angels and spirit guides helping. Uh, um, but then a couple weeks later, when I was meditating, because I was thinking, look, the whole world is blown up with COVID. Shouldn't I be doing something more important than working on this, you know, five people murder case or whatever? And, yeah. um, and uh, I was meditating and I saw my spirit guide, a spirit guide that's been with me my life. And very clearly, and she told me, she used the word mission. And she said, I was doing what I was supposed to be doing. And that half of your mission is to make sure the remains of the children are found because they killed in the name, they killed children in the name of God. And that will not be tolerated. And then she said, the other half of your mission is to use this case to prove to the world that the afterlife is real. Mm -hmm. I don't know if she said to the world, but she said to prove, I think that was it. Um, so, so I was interested that the spirit guide, some of the terminology that's in religious texts actually is terminology that the spirit guides and angels do use. And mission, they do use the word mission. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting insights. Yeah. And you wrote an essay on that, um, on the afterlife, if I remember right. Yeah. So Robert Bigelow, who, um, you know, Skinwalker Ranch up there in Utah? I've heard of it. Yeah. I've watched a documentary on it, I think. Right. So he was doing a contest about who could prove the afterlife. And I wrote an essay and submitted it, which is in the FBI papers. They turned over to the court. So the court now is making, going out of their way. I don't know if you heard. With Detective Hermosillo, the uh, Rob Wood is saying, uh, you, nothing from a psychic helped, right? Nothing from a psychic helped. Oh, and and um, Hermosillo is like, no, you know, and I'm just like, oh my God, well, if nothing helped, why are you guys even talking about it? You know, um, but anyway, so I wrote this essay and it was so traumatic. I actually kind of checked out, I kind of disassociated and meditated and the spirit guide showed me like a pattern that it was going to be. Yeah. And I just kind of disassociated myself because of the trauma related to that. Um, but that, and it got submitted by the Rexburg police department, you know, so, oh, mm -hmm. so there I did it, you know, I did it and it's really up to the spirit guides. I don't have to push anything. Because like when I was upset the other night after hearing Hermosillo deny on the stand the reality of the truth, um, I, I was, I, when I went to bed, you know, I was a little upset, but when I was meditating, they showed me, I, I've done everything I'm supposed to do. Yeah. Interesting. There's nothing else I need to do. Mm. You know? 
So in that sense, you've accomplished your mission, at least for this particular case. And maybe there's more. Do you feel like there's more for you? Um, well, when I did that, Utah, oh no, in Idaho, this Brian Koberger that killed the college students. Yeah. Um, that was pretty traumatic being connected. See, I was in, in Chad's case and in that one, I was connected with the minds of the killers too. So what I'm doing is a little more stronger than just psychic. So there's, you know, you know, the psychic, but then there's mediumship or you're communicating with spirits. Then there's the astral projection, which I think Chad is talking about in his portals or whatever. I have always called them wormholes, yeah. but I do that too, astral project or allow my consciousness to expand where I go out of body. And I'm standing there in 3D watching these people. Okay, and when I'm doing that, I'm in the energy field created by it all. And I'm feeling Tylee, and I'm feeling her mom, and I'm feeling Alex, I'm feeling Chad, I'm feeling, you know, I'm receiving thoughts from all of them. And it, it, it's a kind of trauma that I just kind of put aside. I, I really went gung-ho with Tylee because she was in my house, and my daughter brought her to me, my deceased daughter brought her to me. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the Idaho case, I was connected. There was some point where my spirit guides are all around me at this time and they're guiding everything. But I was connected into his consciousness while he was going through the house and killing everyone. And um, no, I have not wanted to do that again, ever. Mm. I, <laughs> you know, I, I should never say never though because the, there might be a case where I just feel real compelled, but I don't think that I'll do it unless I feel it's brought by spirit. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think I ever, ever want to be connected to somebody's mind while they're committing such atrocities mm -hmm. because it has a long lasting effect. I would it think really so. Hurts. A little bit of trauma of your own to work through there, I'm sure. A huge PTSD. Like even yeah. when this the trial started, well, when I talked to you the other day and I was crying, um, this trial did bring up trauma. So I'm glad we're talking today because I feel like it's so necessary for everybody just to kind of understand like, you know, how Lori got, and I look at Lori too. And because, you know, she's blonde hair, blue eye, cheerleader, you know, all this. And I'm like, how did you get from A to B? Yeah. Yeah. You know, exactly. How did you do that? How, how, in your thinking to see with her, Schizophrenia runs in her family, right? Did you know that? No. Her father is a diagnosed schizophrenic, according to court records, if that if that's true. Her father is a diagnosed schizophrenic. Everyone said Alex was off. Her sister Stacy had a at least a 10-year major struggle with serious mental illness before she died. And so Lori may have been um, susceptible to the delusions a little bit more. Mm. Um, I yeah, don't know. Interesting. Yeah, I never knew Lori or that whole side of the story. She was in Utah, I think, and uh, or Arizona. I don't even know. Um, then, so ch when when I was hearing about this Lori gal, I figured I, I knew that Chad traveled and did speaking events in other cities and stuff. So I just figured it was somebody he met there, but he never talked about her or anything. Yeah. So, um, so I, I went way off course, but so we were still, we were with the church of the firstborn and what's the second tier level um beliefs that you, Chad was filling in or that you talked, there's the reincarnation, the church of the firstborn. Yeah. And the, then, the Davidic servants, probably the bigger, one of the bigger parts of that, this, yeah. this uh, really mighty leader that would come forward in the end. And, and, um and just biblically there's, you know, there's a good case, to support that this figure, this Davidic figure that Ezekiel mentioned is like the kind of the antithesis the of the Antichrist, right? If you if there's opposition and everything, if you have an Antichrist, it kind of makes sense that you would have a, a figure of, of light, you know, working for God uh -huh. doing those sorts of things. So that's a belief in this tier two system. Um, I don't know. There might be other things. I think there were a few other little ones, but those really are the big ones in that tier two system. Um, the whole point of that was to lead up to the tier three system, which okay. Chad and or Chad's followers or the people that read his books and stuff never would have heard of that. Or if they did, I, I was never part of any 
speaking event where he discussed those things. And uh, so the media was the breaking point in the story for those things. Um, this, do you mean the zombie thing and what else? The, yeah, zombie, let's call oh, it, um, you know. A, that light and dark? Yeah. Like, what? They're holding dark spirits or dark spirits have possessed them type of thing. Is yeah, that that's mean? that feels, I mean, if that's the explanation for a zombie, I, I'm kind of like, well, wait a minute. Jesus did talk about possession in the Bible, didn't he? So so Bible and so possession in that sense, that's that's going back to a tier one belief. That should be basic knowledge and belief to everybody right. that, that or anybody who believes the Bible, at least that possession is possible. Absolutely. But, but but again, there's the true part, and then there's this twisting. Um, yeah, and I don't even. The yeah, they twisted. I, that's what I was shown in the readings. It was a twisting of the doctrine. Yeah, yeah, and I couldn't even explain what Chad believed about that. I've heard something. I don't really get it. I don't understand beyond possession. I don't know what that means, and I certainly don't know how you would justify killing somebody for for that especially a child but 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 anyone it's wrong you know so in the old occult books like i like to read these really old occult books and um they talk about influence right so if you're if you're having negative thoughts and you're going to do negative actions there's always going to be dark entities that will come and assist you and see part of the thing even where christianity is veered off is they're, they're afraid to broach that so modern people they want to pretend there's no heaven and hell there's no negative spirits there's no and there and i and i i refuse to play to that because yeah. there is i've seen i've experienced it i've actually seen something called a gin do you know what a gin is no d j i n n i've seen it with my physical eyes so um if somebody carries like a lot of negative thoughts right then there's entities that will come assist them and there's a point where if they're really going to get into this like Lori and those people did those they're going to have more and more influence and at some point like when i was watching them burning Tylee's body, um, I saw a demon go into Lori. Like they showed me, I've I've done I've done way, way, way over a hundred, probably closer to 200 of unsolved murders that I've never up uploaded. That I was doing these for like eight years before I ever uploaded that. And um I've never seen this type of demonic activity. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know if it's by what they were doing that they attracted this or that they sought it out like when they said charles had this ned schneider in him and ned schneider's a dark occult writer that means one of them was reading that kind of material so potentially calling them like you can call on angels in every religion to help you right you can call on the good angels mm -hmm. well People who are into voodoo, santeria, Satanism, they believe that you can call on the good angels and the bad angels and that you're supposed to command them all. So at some point they cross the line. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. Yeah, at some point, yeah, that's where I try to I try to figure out, you know, but I guess some some parts are not shown to me as well. Yeah. I all I can really say to this tier three system is um this is a this is the chad that i did not know most of us didn't know um i didn't know about lori and so as i've learned through the media again what what lori's background was and there was some murderous situations there i all i can say is i i kind of feel like she brought the murder pieces to that little relationship you know yeah, because that, have, again, playing in her mind like that yeah that's just how it settles with me. I'm not saying that's true. I don't know. Um, it's just. I could add something with that. What you're saying is um, I did that Tylee Ryan victory reading or now I retitled it. Tylee shows us heaven uh, after the remains were found. And I did that with a former friend of Lori Vallow. Mm -hmm. Right. She told me that she had called the police because she said for a, 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 a whole year, um, she thinks even before she thinks that was before he met Chad, although I'd have to confirm it before she met Chad. 
that Lori was talking to her about doubling her husband's life insurance because um, think of all what you could do with the money. Oh, yeah. So, so this is before she even meets Chad, if I remember correctly. I'm, you know, if that lady hears me and I'm wrong, then let me know. But it's so that lady thought that Lori had sneaky ideas about that before. And then I've talked with a, a ongoing conversation for a long time with April Raymond. You know, she's been on all the shows about Lori or whatever. And she had some experiences where she was actually concerned about Lori, too. Um, related to insurance issues and with Lori's father being insurance. So Lori knew you can make a lot of money quick if someone who's insured dies. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I, you know, I, I wouldn't argue against that thought that you have that potentially Lori is the one who bought, brought in the ideas of murder. Yeah. Yeah. That's kind of my feeling. I, the only other thing I can really add to this part of the conversation is uh, Chad had a viewing for Tammy in, well, they had the actual funeral in Utah and then they had a viewing or not a viewing. What do you call it? Just a, a memorial service for people that knew her in, in Rexburg. I went to that. He, uh, after the event, I thought it was nice. He was just classic old Chad. He was, he, it was kind of quirky and made some jokes and um, the audience laughed and, um, but he also got emotional and um, that's been interesting for me to think about that. Um, he mentioned, uh, he mentioned an animal pet cemetery in that, in that discussion in, in his um, really? at, yeah. at the memorial service. He mentioned the pet cemetery. Yeah. Or, you know, it might not have been him. It might've been one of one or two of their children. They mentioned this pet cemetery and everybody was kind of like, huh, okay. That was this, new project or hobby they had or something. I can't remember the details there, but that was, it was just a little red flag. And then um, at the end of the service, Chad, Chad shook a few hands up there at the front and then made a beeline for, for me and some other friends that had kind of gathered. We were just sitting there talking and about the service and stuff. And then he came and he, he came and spoke to us. And I actually took a picture of this because um, it was, felt like a significant moment. But he was just telling us it actually felt scripted. To me, it didn't feel like a, an authentic message. Um, it felt like he had rehearsed it. And, and I was like, why? You know, I, I, I've just been processing. Why was that? It just felt weird. But anyway, yeah. he went through a scripted message about the kids and their plans and how um, they were going to, how everybody was fine. Tammy's been visiting him. Um, through the veil and telling him messages, giving him guidance about what to do with the kids and the house and the situation, their money. He said, we're financially set. We're going to be just fine. The insurance is going to come through this week or whatever it was. And, um, and you know, he went through all this stuff just to like, kind of get us, it like answered all our questions in one fell swoop. He shook some hands and he was out of there. Oh, like he had a thing planned that, this is what they're going to be wondering. And I'm just going to put some idea in their head and split. It, that's kind of what it feels like. I don't want to misjudge it, but that's, but it was right. odd. It, it raised a little, I even talked to some friends afterwards, like Chad didn't really seem like himself. Did you notice that? Or, you know, and, and some people kind of noticed. Um, and then, then I went out to my car and I'm sitting there waiting for my wife to come out. And, and I was alone just sitting there thinking about it. And then Chad came up to me again and he went through basically the same speech he just gave us. He went through some of some of his publishing deals that he was going to close. He told me he was going to end the um, Spring Spring Creek publishing business. Um, I had a couple of gigs with him because I had written some books and published with him. And he just he just kind of went on the business end of those and said, "I'm going to give all that. I'm going to give you all the rights for for what you did, and I'm going to leave the publishing business." He, he again, he made a specific point to mention the insurance company and how the, um, how he was going to be compensated and he was going to be set financially. And at that point, it was like, OK, it was a little weird and, and it, things got a little stiff between us. Um, and, and I just shook his hand and said goodbye. And that was the last I ever saw him. Um, but, yeah, so uh, he, he definitely had his cover up. He, he it, had. Yeah, it seemed scripted. Yeah, it seemed like he had he had rehearsed the details of this 
this narrative, this sequence of events, and um, he he knew it inside and out, you know. Yeah. So that's just been interesting for me to reflect on that over the years. Um, oh, I bet. Yeah, it may trip you out to know that you you were friends and trusted somebody who was capable of such horror. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and uh, again, it, it's even shocking to me to think where he is in the court system. It's it's shocking to even think he's. I, I mean, there's been enough media coverage now that it's pretty convincing. We, I think everybody's pretty well convinced that he did it. So to be fair, there's a, there's a court um, hearing to be had. We'll let the people decide if he's guilty or not. I think we all kind of feel what's right there, but we'll see what the evidence brings forward. Um, yeah. Court TV did an interview with me three years ago, and they asked me, they said, um, if your friend Chad is found guilty of murder, you know, would you as his friend, your friend Chad. support, <laughs> would you support, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you go ahead. The death penalty and i and i was like well yeah you know so this this hasn't aired yet i've always wondered when they're going to air that it's probably coming if like why did they ask that you think well i will think you, will, you, will you support the death penalty on your friend if if um he's found guilty like why why the question it's kind yeah. of a strange question i mean they they flew out to do some interviews and stuff i think they wanted to make good use of their time and interview people and get get the get a good story out of it you know and yeah that they could release um sound bites over over time as the case right. unfolds in courts and stuff that's that's all i can figure but and they need something sensational yeah because it's like, why would you ask your friend if 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 you supported the death penalty I don't know. I don't even know why they would do that. Yeah. Yeah. It was a little fishy, but, but the reality is I, I think I answered honestly, it's, I, I still trust, I know there's corruption everywhere, but I still trust the laws of the land and I trust the jury to um, decide I, um, right. and just let justice be served here on earth. Ultimately it doesn't matter to me. I, I know that God will be the judge of things and um, do what's needed there, but. Well, that's, what, that's how I feel too, because yeah. when I, when I figure out who murdered my daughter, uh, it, it, for about three weeks, I really was doing some internal searching about my rights and responsibilities as a mother. In Because four out of five murder victims, do you know that four out of five murders are never prosecuted? So even though the law of the land or whatever, most people never receive justice. Hmm. Um, so this one's high profile, so it's getting all this, but most don't. And so for three weeks, I was like, well, do I go kill the guy? Because he killed my daughter. So should I go kill him? And is it my responsibility to go kill him? And, and all, I mean, a lot of soul searching. And I, I finally came to the conclusion that when he's on the other side, he will be held accountable. Mm -hmm. And it's really, to me, irrelevant. I won't get my daughter back no matter what I do. Um, and I don't even need to hold hatred in my heart because I have full faith in those angels and spirit guides and, and, and even, you know, conversations I've had with them that, that he will be held accountable on the other side. It's not yeah. something I have to even worry about. Mm -hmm. So I, that's, that's what I can. And that's even about Chad and well, Chad and Lori, it, it's so shocking what they did. It's just, shocking out of, out of this world shocking yeah yeah it is well i appreciate you sharing your your story there and your vulnerability there that's pretty sensitive um i yeah i, I think we all just want justice you know to be served yeah. And... yeah i mean i actually wrote a letter to the judge because I, I just wrote a letter to the judge and i said you know i did s s contribute to this case regardless right um and my feeling is even in that first reading, I said, I could see that I could connected with Lori's brain. I knew she was mentally not there. She was not normal at all. Hmm. And I even said in that very first reading, I said, if this lady ever gets back to normal, she's going to go crazy realizing what she's done. Oh, interesting. Yeah. And that was the first reading. And so um, one, I told the judge I didn't think it was correct to um, murder, you know, the state murdering 
it, what's the difference? You, then you're a murderer. It's the biggest conundrum of all, right? If you hate a murderer and you want to murder the murderer, then you're a murderer too. Yeah. You, know, yeah. you have become what you hated. And how do you, how do you give the death penalty to somebody who is clearly mentally insane? And um, I wrote a letter about that. And, you know, if somebody deserved it, I guess she would. But I, I just, I can't see becoming a murderer. It started bothering me that I could be anywhere along the chain of karmic events that would lead to, you know, I'm not going to go murder who murdered my daughter. So why should I be in the karmic chain of events of, of people who want to murder Lori? You know, because she committed all these heinous acts and she should be in prison her whole life without parole. Like she should never be out. Of course. I feel like she was doing demonic possession combined with delusion. And um, I, you know, people get so mad when they see her laughing in court all the time. Like, you know, on social media, they're just like, it infuriates, I think the common sense, it infuriates, especially mothers and stuff. But when I see that, I think she's insane. I think yeah. she is literally insane. And even if she comes back to any moment of sanity and she remembers, eat, you know, eating the flesh of her child, which is what I saw, um, then she goes insane again. You know, yeah. I, I definitely think she has to be kept away from society. But I just it's a big conundrum on anything. If you want to stop a murderer and you murder the murderer, then you've just become a murderer. Yeah. Now, now if there's a difference of self-defense, like if someone breaks into your house, there you are defending your life. If you shoot them, I don't see that as murder, but the planned and the thought. And yeah. so I, I actually felt a little relieved when they removed the death penalty. Interesting. Yeah. I actually didn't even know that. I haven't followed the story very well. So that's, yeah. Well, I trust justice will be served. I uh, this is uncomfortable. It's unpleasant to it's it's unpleasant for me. It's been uncomfortable for my family over the years to uh, for people to know we knew Chad. I don't know why it should be. Um, it was all in good faith to just uh, increase our spirituality and our preparedness and just be good people. And um, it's just it's had a nasty turn, you know. So I sympathize with Chad's family as well. I don't know where they are. We used to be in touch with them and. They've yeah. kind of become isolated, um, but uh, there's a lot of people that are hurting and will will for generations to come over this, and it's really a sad situation. Yeah, it's caused a lot of um, waves, shock waves of of uh, in everyone because I, I surprisingly in all my quest to about before the remains were found, I pretty much talked to almost every single neighbor that Chad had. Like I was just obsessed about the whole thing. And yeah. um, some of them have contacted me since and, and, you know, said they like tried to bring a casserole over to Emma and Emma wouldn't let them in the house, like just really blocked off. And, and uh, how do you deal with that? Yeah, I wouldn't know. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to judge her. It's she's been through a lot. You know, the emotions oh, yeah. of that would be awful. We, none of us can even imagine, you know, um, what that's like. And yeah. then, and then with you, see, so they've associated you with, or early on, not so much anymore, but early on, they were like, it, it, it's a new person with every crime. I've noticed it's a new person every few days. Yeah. So uh, surrounding whoever's the crime and then everyone on social media, it's like a phenomenon. They just dig that person's life apart yeah. and try yeah. to figure out how that person could be complicit or that, you know, that type of thing. Yeah, that's true. It, it still does affect us though, believe it or not. Um, just for an example, this, I have a, an eight year old son and it, he has some schoolmates that have asked to come over to our house. And they're, this one particular mom says she can't because she knows that connection that I knew him. I don't know what she's thinking. Like I'm gonna bury her kid in my backyard because I read his books or something. I'm guilty by association, right? And, and a lot of yeah. that follows me it's unfortunate but it's it's okay it's actually made my family stronger you know in um being compassionate and not judging people and just you know accepting people so anyway and, it's been, and it's been good. you have the story um that like you said at the beginning but you didn't realize and it was the same as that time i was demonically attacked where 
when you experience something, that's when you are really in a position to speak with authority on what you've experienced, you know, the, the, the issues that you brought up and, and knowing, you know, part of this is true, part of this isn't. They added this together. These issues are important, like the church of the firstborn and the reincarnation. And just because, see, I have a feeling that the Mormon church wants to use this to um, scare everyone. If you stray from what we tell you, you'll end up like Chad and Lori. Yeah, yeah. You know? I think you're probably right. I, I couldn't say because I've been out of it for three years, but... Uh, but I have heard that after all that, they came out with new policies. And I think one of them was you're not allowed to read near-death experience books. Um, right. You're not Power. allowed to participate in energy work or practices, basically like what, what you do or energy right. healing or that kind of right. thing and stuff. Yeah. yeah, I have that feeling too. And I, I, there has been a clear conspiracy to deny my work. Um, yeah. And, you know, you, you don't have to speak to that, but even Larry got mad about, Larry Woodcock got mad about something uh, that the judge did a week or two ago. And he was, he finally just lost it and was going off about this Mormon <laughs> conspiracy. Yeah. And it's like, I, I have, I felt that, but there's a lot of good ones too. And that's the thing there. Um, well, the ones from Aval were actually super nice. The ones that were, Cause like one time during it all before the remains were found, I kind of flipped out and I was accusing all the Mormons of being in this big conspiracy of silence and stuff. Oh uh, yeah. And then I went and meditated and my spirit guides, I said, I apologize to my spirit guides for misrepresenting because I'm trying to, you know, when I say, Oh yeah, I'm receiving these things from spirit. And then I turn around and act like, you know, an ass or whatever, <laughs> but, but it's like, um, they showed me a display of, ignorance that's what the spirit guides communicate display of ignorance yeah and then i went back and turned on my group again on facebook and i apologized to them and they were so loving and so kind you know to me yeah you know, i just had a total breakdown and then one of them uh told me because i was looking for a clue called three trees i keep seeing three trees and apparently there's this christian poem that's and by anonymous and it's about three trees and it's about a story being used for something else and God's higher purpose and things like that. So, I mean, I, I broke down and cried and cried and those Mormons really comforted me. They were good and gracious people. Um, but they were, they were, I believe mostly the Aval ones. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't surprise me. There are really good people. And I have a, I have a whole lot we could talk about as far as the church, its current state, it's, um, its division and what that looks like. We could go there sometime if you want, but, the, but the, I mean, in a nutshell, the church is, is very controlling. It's uh, if you look at the strict definition of a cult, it's absolutely a cult um, mm -hmm. in the sense that you're giving all your sovereignty and your autonomy to an individual to make decisions for your life. And um, if there's anything I would, you know, maybe end on or just final thoughts for me is just that, we shouldn't give our sovereignty. We shouldn't give our autonomy to other individuals um, right. in spiritual settings. And I and I'm speaking about the Mormon Church, but I'm also right. speaking about the way I kind of gave some of my my sovereignty to Chad to to be a yeah. spiritual figure in my life and and speak to God for me or whatever. Um, although that didn't happen that much, but it did. It did happen. And and I've you given my sovereignty and my agency away to others to speak. Right to God for me in my behalf. And if there's any lesson I've learned really hard, the hard way through all my um, religious experiences and my experience with uh, post-religion through Chad Daybell and others, it's it's stop giving your agency to people and and go to God yourself. And in fact, God is within us and, and we can turn inward and find answers ourselves. And we can, you know, we're, we're powerful beings and we have this capability in us that's really far greater than any of us realize. I agree. I agree. That's why I try to encourage people pray and meditate, pray and meditate. Pray yeah. is when you talk to God, meditating is when you listen. Yeah. And yeah. Both are important and, and discernment. 
So yeah, so, yeah. Sometime we could come on and talk about the Mormon conspiracies or whatever if you feel like it. Um, yeah, because because I saw one video where they had a mother; she couldn't even go in the temple to watch her own son be married, and I just thought, no, something's wrong there. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. That's there's a little bit too much mind control and social control to call this a. You know, there's always the good with the bad. So it's like you don't want to make a comment and then people who have a true and pure heart are going to be the ones hurt. You know what I'm saying? That's right. Absolutely. And there are really wonderful, some of the one, most wonderful people I've met, really giving and compassionate inside the Mormon church who genuinely love Christ and serve him. Um, right. And just, they would be the ones whose feelings are hurt. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. A conundrum. Just like the murder thing. It's a conundrum. Yeah. Yeah, it is a conundrum. Yeah. But there's but there's some deception going on for everybody in the Mormon church. But to broaden that out a little in Christianity as well, there's some deception. There's some things going on oh, in our politics. So and I, I think I'm in depth about that and not yeah. feeling bad because I was raised Christian and went oh. to Christian school. Oh, yeah. I, I quit believing in hell when um, in sixth grade the, the teacher said I was going to hell. Because I had figured out there was a hole in the chain link fence and I could get told all the other kids and we went over and got candy at 7-Eleven. And then my sixth grade teacher is telling me I'm going to hell now. He was oh. totally serious. And from that moment on, I quit believing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Right up until I was doing these readings again and saw it. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. We could, we could get into the conspiracies sometime. If you have time, I'd love to have you back on. Oh, yeah, I would in a heartbeat. I think it'd be really interesting and eye-opening for people. Definitely. So you just let me know when you're ready. Okay. And then um, I'll put a link for your books. Did you, you have somewhere you need to go, right? Yeah, yeah. But thank you for your time. And, uh, you know, your listeners are welcome to contact me. My email address is eric at doctrinalessays.com if they want to ask anything or have a little chat that's fine um but yeah I'll put, that, I'll put that in the description box also okay yeah perfect thanks don i really appreciate you and the work you're doing thank you for blessing us with your presence eric i really appreciate your right. graciousness thank you it's my pleasure well okay. hopefully we can do it again okay bye all right bye